The origins of the Byzantine Empire begin as far back as 330 AD, when Roman Emperor Constantine created a new Rome on the site of the ancient Greek colony of Byzantium. In 395 AD, Rome split into two separate empires in order to make it easier to rule. The western portion kept the name of Rome, while the eastern portion took the name of Byzantium. And even though the western empire Rome crumbled and fell in 476, the eastern empire survived for over a thousand more years until 1453. Justinian is known as the Byzantine Empire's greatest ruler. Justinian reunited the eastern portion of the Byzantine Empire that split off due to the fact that the Romans believed that they could not control the whole empire if it was so large. Justinian's army, led by General Belisarius, sailed into North Africa and then quickly moved into Italy and defeated the Ostrogoths and expanded the Byzantine Empire. His empire now included Italy, part of Spain, North Africa, the Asia Minor, the Palestine, and Syria. He rebuilt Constantinople, the capital city of the Byzantine Empire, as well as many churches including the Hagia Sophia, and his wife Theodora had always worked by his side. Justinian also created a law code of Roman law. Justinian's code is also known as the body of civil law. This became the source of imperial law in the Eastern Roman Empire until 1453. Since it was the last written product of the Eastern Roman Empire to be written in Latin, it was also used in the West and became the foundation for many of the legal systems in Europe. This law code lasted for over 900 years and it covered all aspects of Byzantine life. When Byzantine was refounded as the New Rome by Emperor Constantine in 330, he named the city of Constantinople after himself, which turned into the capital of the Byzantine Empire. After the destruction caused by riots in 532, Justinian rebuilt Constantinople as once again the New Rome. Since the population was estimated to be in the hundreds of thousands, Constantinople was the largest city in medieval Europe. It was viewed as the center of the empire and a special Christian city. Until the 12th century, Constantinople was the largest center of trade in Europe during the Middle Ages. The city was the chief center for the exchange products between the East and the West. The city was a grand palace complex with hundreds of churches and a huge arena called the Hippodrome. Justinian added many new buildings such as roads, bridges, walls, public baths, law courts, schools, churches, and a large underground pool to hold the city's water supply. The Hippodrome was a huge amphitheater, made of brick and covered by marble that could hold between 40,000 and 60,000 people. Even though gladiator fights were held there, the main events were chariot races. There would usually be about 24 a day. The people of Constantinople adored chariot racing, and the successful charioters were named heroes and honored with public statues. If you lost a race in the Hippodrome, it would usually result in a bloody riot. The first split of the Christian Church took place in 1054 CE and is now known as the Great Schism. The Church split into two halves. The West was now part of the Roman Catholic Church and the East was now a part of the Eastern Orthodox Church. The Roman Catholic Church was Latin and the Pope had authority over the bishops and over all kings and emperors, while priests may not have married and divorce was not allowed. The Eastern Orthodox Church was Greek and the Patriarch and the bishops headed the church as a group and the emperor had authority over the church clergy. In the Eastern Orthodox, the priest may marry and divorce is allowed with certain conditions. The church split due to three things. Icon controversy, control of the new churches in Balkan, and the struggle for power between the Pope in Rome and the Byzantine Emperor Leo III. Icons are symbols of religious significance and icons were used in the East to help aid devotions to God. The Pope in the West supported the use of the icons, but the Byzantine Empire in the East did not. The Byzantine Emperor, Leo III, banned the use of icons because he felt that their use was equal to worshipping things that went against his teachings and his religion. This led to riots and destruction of the icons, and these icon breakers were called iconoclasts. Since the Pope and the Patriarch were both arguing over who had power over the Church, they tried excommunicating each other. Excommunication is when you declare someone an outcast of the Church. And now to John Green to finish us off with some more information on the Byzantine Empire. Hi there, my name is John Green, this is Crash Course World History, and today we're going to talk about the Fall of Rome. Let's go to the Thought Bubble. There was a lot of continuity between the old Western Roman Empire and the new Eastern one. Politically, each was ruled by a single man, sometimes there were two, and once there were 
four, but let's forget about that for now, who wielded absolute military power. War was pretty much constant as the Byzantines fought the Persian Sasanian Empire and then various Islamic empires. Trade in valuable agricultural land that yielded high taxes meant that the Byzantine Empire was, like the Western Roman Empire, exceptionally rich, and it was slightly more compact as a territory than its predecessor, and much more urban, containing, as it did, all of those once independent Greek city-states which made it easier to administer. Also, like their Western counterparts, the Byzantines enjoyed spectacle and sport. Chariot races in Constantinople were huge, with thousands turning out at the Hippodrome to cheer on their favorites. Big bets were placed and there was a huge rivalry, not just about sports, but also about political affiliations between the two main teams, the Blues and the Greens. Thanks for putting us on the Greens, Thought Bubble. That rivalry was so heated that riots often broke out between them, and in one such riot, an estimated 30,000 people were killed. Thanks. Thought bubble. But perhaps the most consistently Roman aspect of Byzantine society was that they followed Roman law. The Romans always prided themselves on being ruled by laws, not by men, and even though that wasn't actually the case after the second century BCE, there's no question that the Eastern Roman Empire's codification of Roman laws was one of its great achievements. And much of the credit for that goes to the most famous Byzantine emperor, at least after Constantine, Justinian. I like your brooch, sir. In 533, Justinian published the Digest, an 800,000-word condensation of 1,528 Latin law books. And to go along with this, he published the Institutes, which was like a curriculum for the Roman law schools that existed all through the empire. Justinian, incidentally, was by far the most awesome of the Byzantine emperors. He was like the David Tennant of doctors. He was born a peasant somewhere in the Balkans and then rose to become emperor in 527. He ruled for almost 30 years, and in addition to codifying Roman law, he did a lot to restore the former glory of the Roman Empire. He took Carthage back, he even took Rome back from the Goths, although not for long. And he's responsible for the building of one of the great churches of all time, which is now a mosque, the Hagia Sophia, or Church of Saint Wisdom. So after one of those sporting riots destroyed the previous church, he built this, which with its soaring domes became a symbol for the wealth and opulence of his empire. The Romans were remarkable builders and engineers, and the Hagia Sophia is no exception. A dome its equal wouldn't be built for another 500 years. But you'd never mistake it for a Roman temple. It doesn't have the austerity or the emphasis on engineering that you see in, for instance, the Colosseum. And this building in many ways functions as a symbol for the ways in which the Eastern Roman Empire was both Roman and not. But maybe the most interesting thing that Justinian ever did was to be married to his controversial theater person of a wife, Theodora. Hey, Danica, can we get Theodora up here? Wow, that is perfect. It's funny how married couples always look like each other. Theodora began her career as an actress, dancer, and possible prostitute before becoming empress, and she may have saved her husband's rule by convincing him not to flee the city during riots between the Blues and the Greens. She also mentored a eunuch who went on to become a hugely important general. Mentoring a eunuch sounds like a euphemism, but it's not. And she fought to expand the rights of women in divorce and property ownership, and even had a law passed taking the bold stance that adulterous women should not be executed. So in short, the Byzantines continued the Roman legacy of empire and war and law for almost a thousand years after Romulus Augustus was driven out of Rome. The Byzantines may not have spoken Latin and few of their emperors came from Rome, but in most important ways, they were Romans. Except one really important way. The Byzantines followed a different form of Christianity, the branch we now call Eastern or sometimes Greek Orthodox. How there came to be a split between the Catholic and Orthodox traditions is complicated. You might even call it Byzantine. What what matters for us are the differences between the churches, the main doctrinal one being about the dating of Easter, and the main political one being about who rules whom. Did I get my whom right there, Stan? Yes! In the West, there was a pope, and in the East, there was a patriarch. The pope is the head of the Roman Catholic Church. He sort of serves as God's regent on earth, and he doesn't answer to any secular ruler. And ever since the fall of Rome, there has been a lot of tension in Western Europe between popes and kings over who should have the real power. But in the Orthodox Church, they didn't have that problem because the patriarch was always appointed by the emperor. So it was pretty clear who had control over the church, so much that they even had a word for it. Caesaropapism. Caesar over Pope. But the fact that in Rome there was no emperor after 476 meant there was no one to challenge the Pope, which would profoundly shape European history over the next, like, 1,200 years. So I would argue that in some important ways, the Roman Empire survived for a thousand years after it left Rome, but in some ways, it still survives today. It survives in our imagination when we think of this as East and this as West. It survives in football rivalries that have their roots in religious conflicts, and it survives in the Justinian Law Code, which continues to be the basis for much of civil law in Europe. Europe.